Welcome to the deep dive. You sent us some really fascinating sources uh, promising to, well, maybe redefine history. And we're here to dig into them. Yes, it's quite the collection. So today we're doing a deep dive into something called the Bugosphere. It's this object that, frankly, sits really uncomfortably between you know, ancient history and something that sounds almost futuristic. Absolutely. It's one of those finds that really challenges everything. It demands a close look, a skeptical look. Definitely, you've got physics and history colliding. Exactly. So our mission today is to unpack its reported properties, these claims of advanced tech, and maybe more importantly, dissect the uh, the big problems with how it was initially dated, that dating is what really made it famous, right? It's the crux of it, yeah. Okay, let's start with that hook. The thing that grabbed everyone back in 2025, the Bugosphere, found in Colombia, March 2025. And the first age number that went around was just yeah. huge, 12,560 years old. Right, 12,560 years. And that immediately puts it deep in the Paleolithic. We're talking millennia before settled farming, let alone, well, advanced metalworking. It just doesn't fit. Not at all. And that number, that specific age, that's what turned it from just a weird discovery into like a global phenomenon. Because as soon as people started looking at what the sphere supposedly does... Then the age makes zero sense. Precisely. The cognitive dissonance is immediate. Okay, let's dive into those properties then. The things that made this metal ball more than just, you know, a strange artifact. The sources list some pretty wild claims. Almost sounds like science fiction. They really do. First up, this thermal thing. A measurable, constant cooling effect. 100 watts, it's like it's actively pulling heat out of the air or something. It's just some kind of internal system. Very efficient. It's anomalous, certainly. 100 watts isn't trivial. But that's almost the uh, the warm-up act compared to the next claim. Right, the main event, the one that just seems to, well, break physics. An 81% reduction in inertia. Yes, that's the one that stops physicists in their tracks. 81%. Explain that for us, for you listening. Why is 81% so revolutionary? Not just, like, a bit better. Well, inertia, fundamentally, it's an object's resistance to changes in motion, right? Speeding up, slowing down, changing direction. Engineers battle inertia constantly. Think spacecraft, high-speed trains. Mm. The stress is immense. Okay. So reducing inertia by 81%, that's not just making something feel lighter. It's not like better lubrication. It suggests you're somehow manipulating the object's effective mass or maybe even its interaction with space-time itself. Wow. We're talking about technology that could allow for, say, near instant acceleration without turning the passengers into paste, or maybe building structures that don't suffer fatigue. It's a fundamental breakthrough, something we absolutely haven't achieved publicly. If it's real. If it's real, exactly. It represents physics we don't currently have. So when you put it like that, you totally get why the media went nuts. You mentioned the Times of India report, August 2025. It looks ancient, mm. but it acts futuristic. The perfect storm for headlines. And just to add one more layer of weirdness before we uh, start to pick apart that timeline, mm. the claim that it responds to Sanskrit chants. Yes, that detail often gets mentioned. It adds this mystical element, doesn't it? It really does. Inertia reduction, and it listens to ancient languages. It's almost too perfect a story. It's a fantastic narrative. Ancient wisdom meets impossible tech, but... And this is the big but. The entire ancient part hinges completely on that 12,560-year date. And that's where the science really started to push back almost immediately. Okay, let's shift gears to that crucial flaw. The sources are very clear on this point. Mm -hmm. That initial age came from carbon-14 dating. But, but, mm -hmm. and this is key, they tested a resin coating on the sphere not the metal itself. Exactly. And this is more subtle than just saying C14 is for organic stuff. The real problem here is contamination and association. Okay. Think about it. You bury a metal object. Over time, it picks up stuff from the environment. Soil, microbes creating biofilms, maybe even resins or glues added much later. Right. Layers of gunk, basically. Pretty much. So if you C14 date that resin, what are you actually dating? You're dating the carbon in that resin when it hardened or maybe even carbonate exchange later, it tells you absolutely nothing, zero, about the age of the metal core underneath it. Okay, that seems like a pretty fundamental mistake then. Why wouldn't they try to date the metal? I mean, if it's this potentially amazing thing, can you even date metal artifacts directly? That's a great question. And the short answer is not with carbon-14. Metals don't breathe carbon like plants or animals do, so C-14 just doesn't apply. You need different techniques. Uh -oh. 
And the sources, they point to peer-reviewed critiques mentioning places like the University of Georgia's Isotope Studies Center. The consensus is clear, dating that resin to get the Spears age. It's just scientifically yeah. unsound. You can't do it. So the resin could be old, could be new? It could be anything. The 12,560 years might be the age of some ancient tree sap that got stuck to it much later, or contamination from old carbon in the soil, or even a modern binder that somehow incorporated old carbon. It tells us about the environment or the coating, not the object. So that massive Paleolithic age claim, it just evaporates, basically. <laughs> Gone. It's likely dating the dirt, not the artifact. This really highlights why archaeology has to be so careful, doesn't it? Mm. It's not just what you date, but understanding the limits of the dating method itself, even when used on the right type of material. Absolutely. And for you listening, understanding these limitations with radiocarbon dating is really key when you hear about these sensational finds. C14 dating isn't perfect. It has known issues, systemic inaccuracies that scientists constantly have to adjust for using calibration curves. Can you give an example? Sure. A classic one is the fossil fuel effect, or the Suze effect. Scientists figured this out back in the 1950s. Basically, since the Industrial Revolution, we've pumped enormous amounts of CO2 into the atmosphere from burning fossil fuels, coal, oil, gas. That fuel is geologically ancient, meaning all its carbon-14 decayed away millions of years ago. So we're adding dead carbon to the air. Exactly. We're diluting the natural atmospheric concentration of C14. This dilution can be up to 3%. Which means? Which means if you test a sample today and you don't account for that dilution, it will have proportionally less C14 than it should have based on natural levels. It will look older than it really is. Ah, I see. So even for organic stuff, it's complicated. Very complicated. And that's just one factor. Even before you get to the massive error of trying to date metal via some random residue stuck to it. Right. So, okay. We have pretty much dismantled the ancient dating claim. But the tension is still there, isn't it? it we is. have this object, the bugosphere, with these Frankly, baffling properties, the cooling, the inertia thing. But now we have no reliable age for it. We know it's probably not 12,000 years old, but yeah. how old is it? How do we find out? And that's the crucial next step, logically. The investigation needs to shift focus. Forget C14. We need methods specifically designed for inorganic materials, for metals. Methods that look at physical changes over long periods or the composition itself. Like what? What would you actually test on a metal sphere? Well, you'd look at things like thermoluminescence, maybe, or mass spectrometry. Okay, break those down a bit. Yeah. Thermoluminescence. TL dating is usually for things like pottery or rocks that have been heated. Basically, materials like quartz trap background radiation over time. When you heat them in the lab, they release that energy as light. The amount of light tells you how long it's been since they were last heated or exposed to sunlight. So how does that help with a metal sphere? You wouldn't date the sphere directly, but you could date the sediment it was buried in. If you find quartz grains right next to the sphere, dating them tells you when the sphere was likely buried. It gives you a minimum age for its context. Okay, that makes sense. And mass spectrometry. Mass spectrometry, especially for surface analysis, that gets really detailed. You can analyze the exact composition of the metal, any alloys, trace elements. You could look at the oxidation layers, the rust or patina. The type and depth of oxidation might give clues about age or environment. Could it even tell you, like, where the metal came from? Potentially, yes. Isotopic signatures in the metal might match known ore deposits or even point towards specific, maybe modern industrial refining processes. You might even find traces of atmospheric elements from when it was smelted, if it was smelted. So these methods move us away from the, uh, the headline grabbing ancient stuff and more towards well, actual material science, uh, from archaeology to metallurgy almost. Precisely. It's about getting verifiable data about the object itself, not its potentially contaminated coating. And understanding why these different methods are needed, that's crucial for you, the listener, to separate plausible science from just, you know, exciting speculation. Okay, let's sum up what we've covered in this deep dive then. The biggest fear is a real object. It seems to exhibit some genuinely weird physical properties, the cooling effect, the massive inertia reduction. Those are the potentially revolutionary bits. Agreed. Those properties are the core mystery now. But the initial claim, the really big one about it being over 12,000 years old, that rests entirely on flawed C14 dating of a resin coating, which is scientifically invalid for dating the metal. Yes, we can confidently say that Paleolithic data is off the table based on that evidence. What's left is an object demonstrating potentially impossible technology for 2025, regardless of its actual age. 
which raises a different question. Exactly. If this tech is real, where did it come from now? Mm. And that brings us to our final thought, something for you to chew on. What if? What if the next round of tests using proper methods like mass spectrometry or TL, dating on the burial context, shows it's not ancient? What if it confirms the sphere is, say, relatively modern, made in the last 50 years, maybe even the last 10? The entire narrative flips, doesn't it? Completely. We stop asking, how did Stone Age people build this impossible thing? And instead, we have to ask a much more, maybe unsettling question. Who, in our modern world, developed technology capable of 81% inertia reduction, kept it secret, and then let it surface disguised as an ancient archaeological find in Colombia? The idea of a hidden terrestrial technological breakthrough being deliberately revealed as an out-of-place artifact, well, that's arguably a far more compelling and maybe even more concerning scenario than ancient aliens or lost civilizations. It certainly brings the mystery much closer to home. Okay, we'll leave you with that thought. Stay curious. And keep questioning the evidence. We'll catch you on the next Deep Dive.